I am a complementarian. This means that I believe while men and women are both created in the image of God and are equals in both value and worth, they each serve a different function. So in the home, the husband has been given the authority to lead his wife, whereas the wife was created to help her husband and to follow his leadership. I believe that the authority and the submission within the home pictures the relationship between Christ and his church. Complementarians also believe that the office of pastor or elder is reserved for men only since they are to teach and exercise authority. Now, within complementarianism, I hold to what is now, unfortunately, a minority view. I believe that the functional difference between men and women should be symbolized to both men and angels when the church gathers together for worship. So yes, I believe that head covering, as taught in 1 Corinthians 11, is both a transcultural and a timeless symbol for Christians under the New Covenant. In this video, I'd like to share a challenge to my complementarian brethren who agree with what I've said about the role relationships of men and women, but who reject the symbol of head covering as a cultural practice. I believe that this is inconsistent and that it actually undermines complementarianism, and I'd like to show you why. Now, if you ask a complementarian why they believe women can't be pastors, they turn to a passage like 1 Timothy 2, which explains why a woman cannot teach or exercise authority. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now, if someone was going to argue for women being pastors by saying that was a cultural issue, a complementarian would challenge that point by pointing out that Paul says the reason is based in the creation order, so it can't be cultural. And I agree with that fully. But now, my complementarian friend, I want to challenge you to remain consistent as we examine this next verse. Here's what Paul says. For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. In this passage, Paul says why women must have a symbol of authority on their head. He says it's because of the created order. This is huge! In both passages, he tells us his reason for each command. And it's how God has created men and women to function before the fall of man. In 1 Timothy 2, he says, For it was Adam who was first created, then Eve. That's his reason. And in 1 Corinthians 11, For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. Same reason. So that's why I believe that the cultural argument regarding head covering is inconsistent complementarianism. Now, complementarians usually get around this by making a separation between the principle and the symbol. As an example, here's what the ESV Study Bible says about head covering. Paul's appeal to the order of creation shows that his words are not merely directed at the cultural situation of his day. The principle of male headship in marriage continues through all generations, though some cultural expressions of that principle, that women should wear head coverings, may vary. So this study Bible sees that Paul appeals to the creation order in 1 Corinthians 11 and says that his words can't be cultural. But then it makes a separation between the principle and the symbol, which Paul does not do, and says that only the principle of male headship is transcultural, but the symbol of head covering was a cultural expression. Let's now see how they handle 1 Timothy 2 and see if they're consistent. Paul's argument indicates that gender roles in the church are not simply the result of the fall, but are rooted in creation and therefore apply to all cultures. Some interpreters argue that the prohibition in 1 Timothy 2.12 does not apply today because 1. The reason for Paul's command was that women were teaching false doctrine in Ephesus, or 2. Paul said this because women in that culture were not educated enough to teach, or 3. This was a temporary command for that culture only. 
but Paul's appeal to the creation of Adam and Eve argues against those explanations. Now wait a minute. In that head covering passage, they made a distinction between the principle and the expression of it. They said one can uphold the principle as timeless, but recognize that the expression was cultural. But here in 1 Timothy 2, they don't allow for a separation of principle and expression. Notice how they don't say the principle of male headship is timeless, but women teaching communicated something contrary to that principle in that culture. After all, it could be argued that teaching is not inherently wrong for women to do. After all, in Acts 18, Priscilla helped teach Apollos, who was a preacher by the way, the word of God more clearly. So, I believe that if they treated this passage the same way they did with head covering, they could conclude that women can now teach in church because women teaching today does not communicate the same thing that it did in their culture. But they don't. And I'm glad that they don't because that would be wrong. I just wish that they wouldn't do it for head covering too. Now, this inconsistent treatment is regularly pointed out by people who reject the complementarian view. They point out this glaring inconsistency so that you'll join them in embracing egalitarian roles. Rachel Held Evans, who is a self-described Christian feminist, says, Anyone who says that Paul's instructions regarding the women at Ephesus are universally binding because he appeals to the creation narrative to make his point can be consistent in that position only if they also require women in their church to cover their heads as Paul uses a very similar line of argumentation to advocate that. See 1 Corinthians 11. I now want to show what a complementarian blogger has said about these egalitarian arguments. When I said in the beginning that I'm worried that the cultural view of head covering undermines complementarianism, this is what I mean. Just listen as he realizes that Paul's appeal in 1 Timothy 2 is not really that strong based on his cultural view of head covering. Here's what he says. I have grown to see that my treatment of, say, 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15, has not always reflected a sensitivity to the points made in an egalitarian exegesis of this passage. For example, I used to think that Paul's mandate here is obviously transcultural because it is rooted in the doctrine of creation. Then I realized that Paul's instruction about head covering in 1 Corinthians 11, which I have always accepted as culturally conditioned, is also rooted in creation. There is no reason in principle why exhortation grounded in the doctrine of creation must necessarily be transcultural. Do you hear what this self-described complementarian is saying? He's referring to the passage where Paul says women cannot teach or exercise authority in the church, and he's saying that even though Paul appeals to the creation order, that doesn't mean it must be transcultural. I mean, how can it be? Because head covering is cultural, right? See, this is what I mean. A wrong understanding of head covering can lead to an undermining of biblical manhood and womanhood. So my hope is that my complementarian brothers and sisters will hold firm not only to the principle of male headship, but also to the Christian symbol of head covering, which visually depicts it. If you'd like to learn more about Christian head covering and why we believe it's to be practiced today, head on over to headcoveringmovement.com study.